Stanley Cups are my recent bug. This is the time I'm going to look on social media for, you know, in the morning, not necessarily first thing, sometimes first thing. <laughs> Absolutely, they like suck you right in. You feel like I could go for a hike in these and yeah, amazing. I know, I know. Bridget Jones was onto something, huh? Hey, I'm Casey J, and welcome to Young Scott's new This Is How I Feel podcast where we talk to guests who've grown up or live in Scotland about their experiences and how they cope in the world we find ourselves in today. In each episode, we'll tackle a different topic with a brand new guest. And today we are really excited to be chatting to Laura Young about climate anxiety, activism and burnout. You might know Laura from her campaigning work, which aims to see single-use disposable vapes banned across Scotland and the UK. Laura is also an award-winning climate activist, environmental scientist and ethical influencer. Now, Laura has been nominated for and won a range of awards. She was even a finalist at our very own Sunday Mail Young Scott Awards. So let's get into it. All right, Laura, uh, that was a big spiel from me. Do you feel uncomfortable when people list all your accolades like that? Or are you chill about it now? I mean, it feels like hearing your CV back. <laughs> you know, you're sort of like, okay. No, do you know what? I mean, I think it's good because often you just bumble along in life and maybe forget what you do. No, no, it's good. And it reminds you of, you know, in the work I do, there's so many frustrating moments and failures and all that. So it is sometimes good to look back and go, okay, we have achieved things whether it's me personally or with all the campaigns that you do it, it is good to hear it so. because how often do you take a moment to actually you know tally that up because it's always on to the next thing isn't it you never really take stock yeah and when you work in the environmental sector like your job is never done so it is sometimes good to pause and say that was a small win and that was you know chipping away at the big problems but it can be hard because you know even the campaigns that you've mentioned, even the stuff about vapes, for example. Uh -huh. I won an award for that campaign, but it's not over. You know, we've not solved it. But I think it's also important because I'm sure we'll get onto it. But you need those things that keep you going. So certainly, yeah, it's always good to look at the highlights. Those little landmarks. But yeah, you're doing amazing work to chip away at that issue, though, amongst, you know, everything else that you've been up to. Never stop working. I want to say that Laura was posting a TikTok on her way in. <laughs> The work is never done. You've always, you've got to be, <laughs> honestly, you've got to just keep going with it. But but I think I love it. You know, it's a way of chance, people. It's a tool in your toolbox. Well, welcome, Laura. And thank you so much for joining us. Now, we are going to kick off with a simple question that we ask all our guests. How are you feeling today? I feel good. You know, we're kind of recording this near the end of January. January blues can sometimes be a thing, but... I feel we've had some nice snowy wintry weather, which I think looks beautiful, especially when you're inside and you can just get to look out. Uh, I feel it's a new year. I've got, you know, sort of lots of exciting projects coming up this year, but also it's not too overwhelming yet. So yeah, I feel, I feel good. I'm ready good. to take on the new year. Absolutely. Uh, although you're right, you probably haven't been able to get out of the house in Dundee. No, no. Lots of snow, Yeah. lots of rain, lots of flooding, but very relevant to what I do. So. It's always a good story. <laughs> Look at the environment around us. Exactly. <laughs> it's happening. Uh, now, we heard a little bit about your work, Laura, in the intro, but I am really keen to hear more about you and what inspired you to get into all the incredible stuff that you've got going on just now. Yeah. I mean, to be honest, I work in the environmental sector. So when I was at school, I just loved geography. And I didn't really know what I wanted to do as a job. I couldn't really see what a career might look like. But I just knew... This is a subject that I really like. So I just kind of went to pursue it and didn't really have too many hopes, just said, let's see where it goes. And so, you know, years went by, went to uni, studied it even more and just loved it, fell in love with it and have been working in that ever since. And I think part of it is that it's kind of academically, it was the only thing I liked at school. So you just jump two feet in. This is what I did with English Lit. Yeah. But Jane Eyre can't solve the climate crisis. Do you well, know what I mean? But creative people have a big part in it. So honestly, <laughs> you know, I work with so many creatives, but, you know, I think like just pursuing something you're passionate about it is a great start. Yeah. It was a mixture of, you know, loving this subject area, but also really seeing the need for change. And I think that's what really got me into this. But to be honest, I think I became a bit of a campaigner and everyone's a bit of an activist. There's not one way of doing it. But I think I became it when I was at university, but coming to the end of it and thinking, oh my goodness, what am I supposed to do after this? I have no idea. Didn't have any job lined up, you know, didn't really know. But right in my final year, we had Blue Planet. So many people watched that. And I remember just thinking, okay, 
even if I can just play my part, like even uh-huh. if I just try and think about the little changes I could do. And that's when I made a New Year's resolution, so this was 2018, to just try to be more sustainable and started documenting my journey. And when I started to document it, was doing it on Instagram, that's where Less Waste Laura came from. It was just a place to document a New Year's resolution. And from that, it's obviously grown into more of a space to not just say, here's my favorite plastic-free products uh-huh. or shops, but now it's obviously a place to say, here's the big issues of today, but here's how you can get involved and here's how we can all make a change. But really, it just came out of my favorite sales subject, seeing the change that we need to make, and then just giving it a go. So January really is the time when you thrive. Yeah, January is when I come out my bubble and say, <laughs> what am I doing this year? What tackling? So yeah, but that's why, and that's why I love New Year's resolutions because actually you never know what might happen when you set one because I set one and then made, well, a career out of it, but also it really brought to me, okay, this is what I'm supposed to be doing for my career, my job, and, and I've loved it ever since. Uh-huh. And I think that's a really hard thing to stick to. I mean, everybody does it, right? Every year yeah. you sit and you go, no chocolate. You know? yep. <laughs> I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that. Was that the first one that you really stuck to? Yeah, I think so. I mean, and I think partly because it was quite manageable. You know, I think sometimes we set really unrealistic ones. Yes. But it was totally manageable. And and I also, interestingly, people always say, where did Less Waste Laura come from? And it was because when I was beginning to document it, I said, I should probably make a page for this. So I made an Instagram. And at the time there was this trend, it's still a bit of a trend called zero waste living. And I just thought that feels really unattainable and also not really the point. You know, it shouldn't be about me being perfect and that'll solve everything, it's about all of us. And that's why I picked less waste, Laura, had a bit of a ring to it, but also because I thought if I do zero waste, Laura, I'll never achieve it and it'll just crash and burn. But I set a really manageable task, which was I'm just going to explore what it looks like to be more sustainable, but in a way that I can actually carry on throughout the year. Do you think that sharing that publicly helped kind of hold you accountable in a way as well? Yeah, definitely. And it also, it's a two-way street. So when I started it, it was because people were saying, what was that shop that you bought that thing from? Or can you tell me why that's more sustainable? I don't really understand. So I used it as a place to document, but also inform. And, you know, I think if anyone also goes to college or uni or has a really cool job, you should share it with people because not everyone gets a chance to do these things. So I was also kind of threading in some of the knowledge that I had from my background. I want to know though, right, what was the first sustainable change that you can you can remember making? Was mm. it like a water bottle? Was it period pants? Talk to me. Both have period pads on right now. That, yeah. Yes, I, I love think that them. Was, yeah, and to be <laughs> honest, I also love this because... There's some changes that are just purely environmental, right? So you have a plastic toothbrush, you get a bamboo toothbrush. Really, that's just an environmental change. It doesn't really change your life that much. With period products, it's not just good for the environment. Oh my gosh, it's good for money. You know, it saves you loads of money. They might be a bit more expensive to buy at the first place, Mm. but they last forever. And it also just saves you from running out, those embarrassing moments. And they're so good for things like going to the gym, going hiking, amazing. So I think the period products were one of the first things as well. I remember my mum got me a moon cup for Christmas, which is Go so mom. random. Go and I also mom. like half opened it and was like, I'm not going to open that in front of everyone. But it was one I of the first that. things that I did. So 2018, got a menstrual cup. Uh-huh. And I still have it. I've never had to buy another one. And I've got a few period pads and period pants that just supplement it. And you think it's just, yeah, been so great. And it was one of the first things. And it's something I'm such a big... I've, and I know you're really passionate about that stuff as well. It's yeah. period poverty, sustainability. It's all wrapped in one. And may I say, so comfy. So comfy. <laughs> Absolutely. They like suck you right in. You feel like I could go for a hike in these. And yeah, amazing. I know. I know. Bridget Jones was on to something, huh? Absolutely. But it is, <laughs> but I do love finding these things that you think it's not just addressing, you know, the waste that's associated with it. It's actually addressing lots of other issues, um, you know, around cost, affordability, just the idea of, you know, never having to forget or, or miss out, always having something there. Makes your life easier. And also think about how many single use products come from that whole market, you know, it, it's wild. The amount of even like the wrapping of, you know, it, you're, you're really doing something there. One person can actually make an impact there by that switch. Yeah. Able to. 
And it's good as well to see that, you know, here in Scotland, we've got obviously free period products in yeah. public places, which is great. But lots of organisations are also trying to give out the reusables. Yeah. I remember when I was at um, doing my master's in Edinburgh, I was part of the lacrosse team. Uh -huh. And I was talking to them about my moon cup. And I was like, the uni gives them away for free. And I like collected all these up. And I was like, Oprah, I was like, you get a moon cup and you get them. I was like throwing them at everyone over the dinner. And I was like, there we go, everyone, go. But it was amazing because it really does, you know, change people's lives at times because they are, honestly, I'm such an advocate for them. Um, and I love that, you know, more schools are doing talks about it and at unis and colleges, they've got stalls. Yeah, such a fan. Do you know what's wild as well? Your mum must be so incredibly proud of you. But to see you give out moon cups just like she gave to you, that must have been a real moment for her. Yeah, but she does also go, oh God, you talk about it a lot. <laughs> She's like, it's not the most glamorous thing. I mean, we're all up for like talking about it and transparency. We love it. But she has like, oh gosh, you know, it's kind of funny. It's that generation thing, isn't it? It's like, oh, yeah, I do it in your own time. Yeah. Save it. I know. <laughs> but it's good. Yeah. She loves it. What about a wee starter pack then? Like in terms of small changes that people could make, you know, yeah. at the next payday? Yeah. Well, do you know... The thing that I always tell people to do is a waste audit, right? It sounds so boring, but when I first was doing this New Year's resolution and uh -huh. trying to discover everything, I was actually away for New Year. So came back to my flat after, you know, having lovely time away and had this in my head, like, this is going to be my New Year's resolution. And when you walk back into your flat with this idea of, I really want to cut my waste and be more sustainable you suddenly walk in and go, oh my goodness, there's a lot to change. So, you know, you go to the bathroom and you look at all your toiletries, all completely packaged in plastic. Mm -hmm. You go to the kitchen, you know, everything is wrapped in plastic. You suddenly realise you've got a big job ahead of you. And in that moment, you can't just say, okay, I'm going cold turkey and I'm going to not buy anything. Because then you go to the supermarket and what would you do? So what I decided to do was for two weeks, I just collected my waste. So even if I was out and about, you know, if I got a takeaway coffee or I got a meal deal, whatever it is, I just kind of kept it with me until I got home. And after two weeks, I just looked at it. I just put it all out on the kitchen floor and was like, what waste do I actually produce? Because- The image is scaring me already. I know, right? It was quite overwhelming because yeah. when you actually see it all laid out mm. and I started to kind of sort it out and say, well, you know, these things are all the same or these are the same category. And I started to look at it. And one of the things I realized as a final year university student, you know, I was kind of cramming for exams. I was doing my dissertation. I wasn't really that great at remembering. Just functioning. My yeah, <laughs> ah, just functioning. And I realized looking at my waist, half of it was just to do with lunches and food on the go. So I would wake up and just go to the library. I would get takeaway coffees. I would mm -hmm. get a meal deal. I would get, you know, takeaway boxes of stuff from local cafes. And I realized in that moment, okay, to tackle half of my waste, I just need to get a coffee cup and remember it, take a set of cutlery with me everywhere I go, take a little box and maybe try and pack my lunch a few days a week, right? Not not massive changes. And I did that for a few weeks and suddenly realized, okay, I've halved my waste. And then I did it again and, and you find other options. And the reason I think it's important to do that is when I was talking to my grandparents about this, I was like, so everybody should get a takeaway coffee cup and reusable and da da da. And they were like, Laura, we're in our 80s. Do you really think <laughs> we walk anywhere with a coffee? We like to sit and watch the world go by. But it's true, you know, actually for everyone, your waste will be different. If you're a university student, maybe it is the meal deals, the takeaway coffee cups. If you're a young professional who, you know, whatever it might be, you, you'll have your own waste. And so I think there is a good starter pack for everyone. You know, it's a water bottle, a coffee cup, a set of cutlery, none of which needs to be new. You've probably got stuff in your house that, that will suit already. But for actually addressing waste, you know, people might be able to to look at their waste and, and tweak it. So there is starter packs and little things I'd recommend, but there's also just people taking the time to look at their own waste and thinking, what are the wee changes I could make? This is why we need people to individually chip away at it, right? And, you know, on the face of it, climate anxiety and, you know, everything that's going on in the world, how the heck do you contend with that not being overwhelming on a daily basis when you show up to work? Yeah, it is difficult. I mean, I think partly it's about getting active. So, you know, if we if we sit and do nothing globally, we're obviously not going to make the change. But even just personally, I find it's good to get that sort of anxious energy out mm -hmm. by, by going in and trying to help. And so whether that's, you know, going and picking the litter that's in your park so that you look at it and go, it's gone, it's fixed. You feel better instantly. Or whether that's, you know, joining a local community group and saying, 
how can I help with whatever issues you know you're trying to do so you know there might be a little nature reserve in your area and you can like help be part of the the team that looks after that or it might be you know joining a group that's trying to get some stuff changed in your local area I think getting involved can be helpful and that's certainly what I find and even though my work all surrounds it even in my spare time, I'm, I'm trying to to kind of do my bit and join with other people. And, you know, I think over the years I've done stuff like been part of the Youth Ocean Network with the Marine Conservation Society, the Scottish Wildlife Trust Young Leaders, 2050 Climate Group, young people across Scotland trying to do stuff. So it's also just getting together with other people and saying, how can we help each other out? And sometimes it might be as extreme as you then launch a whole campaign to try and and disposable vapes for example but you know it doesn't even need to be that it can just be joining with people because the main thing about climate anxiety is it's not going to go away until we solve the problem so we may as well just get on with trying to solve the problem you know I don't think taking a bubble bath or reading a book or going for a walk will solve it it will help in the short term but actually getting involved getting surrounded people who you know are with you on the cause is probably the best thing you can do. And, and on a personal level, Laura, has that helped you to kind of deal with that sense of like, oh my goodness, you know, at least there's other people that are in this with me. Because sometimes I suppose when you are that one person picking up the crisp packet on the walk and people are going, well done, sweetheart. Yeah. You know, you're like, ah, there are more of us at least trying yeah. to do something here. Yeah. And I think also in the news, we often just hear the negative stories mm. and there are a lot of them, you know, the kind of big impacts that are happening or the really poor decisions that might be happening from governments or businesses. But when you get plugged into these groups, you also hear about the really great stuff, you know, the really cool stories locally about schools that are taking on stuff in their curriculum or local groups that have managed to save a green space and are doing some cool stuff with biodiversity or, or whatever it might be and I think hearing those good news stories is great but also yeah just having people around you to help you support you in the work that you're doing but also vice versa I think is yeah absolutely crucial yeah now, uh, let's talk about activism mm. right because as you say before people are probably you know influencing people in their inner circle more than they realize yeah. just by doing their thing yeah and that is kind of how you got into it, right? With your resolution and all, you know, putting your content out there, showing people your journey. But how do you juggle, you know, I don't want to say being like the face of a cause, because but you are, you know, realistically, you know, you've put yourself out there and it, yeah. it's it's amazing. But how do you kind of grapple with that in your own head? Like going, I, okay, right, I need to do this and I need to put that out there. Is that ever a challenge? Hmm. I don't know. I mean, I think sometimes it just happens. Yeah. You know, you end up being the face of it. And I think, so the Disposable Vapes campaign, just as an example, mm -hmm. it's not just me. There are so many people involved. There's people who have done policy work and briefings and documents and research. People who have organised meetings, you know, run the Zoom groups, being able to make the tea and coffee, like all of this stuff, which is so important. And some of them just don't want their face to be it. Yeah. And others, it's just about skill set. And so I think actually sometimes it just works out that you end up saying, well, my role in this campaign is being the face of it or being the one who goes onto the radio or goes onto the TV to do that. And and that's OK. Um, and there's lots of times where, you know, that's not my role. You know, I'm the one making the tea and the coffee or running the Zoom room or taking the meeting minutes, you know. And I think sometimes it's, it's just about, yeah, kind of seeing that. So sometimes it's also just realising like, if that's what it takes, you know, putting myself on the face of it or putting myself out there, I'm okay with that because it'll, it'll get us where we need to go. Well, it makes it more accessible, doesn't it? Because you know yourself when you see something that's very yeah. obviously basically an advert. Yeah. You, you do switch off. Something cognitively happens and you go, well, this is an agenda. <laughs> yeah. yeah, absolutely. So I love a person. I love a story. And I think, but it comes, you know, it comes with time. You know, when I started posting stuff online about sustainability my face wasn't even on it you know mm. I was just showing products that I thought were cool or campaigns and things that were going on and slowly I just kind of brought my face into it and was talking about you know because that's what people were interested in they're interested in the person behind it um, but I think also one of the best things I've always had people say is oh, it's just, you're just so, you know, friendly about all of this. And I think sometimes when it's like a big organisation, yeah. you're going to be a bit, it's quite removed. You don't really know who's there. Daunting. But I'm just, yeah, I'm just a person just trying to do my bit and sharing my stories and sharing my fails as well. You know, like when I've got it wrong um, 
or something I'm struggling with, you know, I think that can be helpful for people to to actually see a person behind it. Do you remember the first bit of content that you made that fully exposed your identity? Yeah, I think it was to do with a... I think I went full on as well. I think it was to do with a shampoo bar. Uh-huh. And because one of the criticisms was people were like, oh, it just doesn't work. Like it doesn't, it doesn't lather, lather up. Like it's hot. <laughs> and I was like, it does, like it does lather. And so I think I like was in the shower and decided to just like lather Gosh, up. Wow. And I like put my hair up. And it was just a photo of my face. I was gonna say, what a way <laughs> Goodness. Full on show shot. No. It was like I did this big, like lathered it all up and like spiked my hair up. You and Mark like, Simpson did it like Yeah. And I took a photo to be like, as in it was like here, just yeah, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. there Don't you worry, go. It's okay, That's not... my shampoo bar. But <laughs> Lush did actually take the photo and post it on their own Stop. channel. So it was quite an overwhelming, like, f- real first kind of, like, boom. That was one of my big first, okay, my face is now out there. You mm. know, I'm sure I'd maybe shown snippets of my face before, but that was the first real, like, I'm trying to prove a point here that this is a good product. And then, yeah, it went quite, like, that was, like, OG viral back in the day. <sighs> like, yeah, it was quite, but it was good because actually people were like, Oh, this is interesting. It feels like a person. It's and, amazing. Because if anybody, if Lush posted a picture of me in the shower, I'd be absolutely horrified. <laughs> so I'm really pleased that you've taken that one well. <laughs> yeah, I know. I know. I was a bit like, oh, okay, there we go. Wow. I know. Yeah. <laughs> I was, made it, mom. I'm <laughs> adding model to the CV. That's so good. Whereas before that was just a hand model. Exactly. Wow. Yeah. Just a few little bits and pieces. What about the the feedback that maybe is slightly more negative? Now I can imagine with the the vape campaign specifically, so much, yeah. you might have some angry comments. Yeah, uh, how is that to deal with? Mm, it's interesting. I think the disposable vape stuff's been going on for you know a year to eighteen months now, mm-hmm. and actually it's interesting to see that sometimes over that time, people that were quite negative or quite confrontational at the beginning have kind of gone on a bit of a journey and sometimes are now kind of seeing what it's about because sometimes people just think wow this person's really full on they're wanting to ban things and they're talking about all this which can be quite full on but actually when you take them on a journey you know you can kind of win them over but actually one of the things I love and some platforms are really really good for this TikTok in particular yeah. if you get um, a comment that's quite critical or maybe it's you know got misinformation it's wrong or it's it's an opinion that kind of keeps coming back you can reply to it with a video in a really educational way you know I'm not going this person's horrible look at their comment I'm saying actually <laughs> here's a really good moment for us to take what this person has said and sometimes many people say it so it can be a voice that you hear quite a lot and and actually let's go into it you know let's explain it the kind of classic ones, you know, I've been doing a few videos recently about overconsumption and just this idea that we just tend to buy way too much and, yeah. and we don't need to buy it. And Stanley Cups are my recent bugbear. These ginormous water bottles that were actually made to be reusable and save waste, but now people have tons of them and it's become a big issue. All I hear about oh. is the car went on fire. Oh, the, ca- <laughs> the car! <laughs> the car went on fire. And then she took the cup out the car, shook it, died. Oh, ice. Ice. <laughs> But what's happened now is we have this like huge boom, right? And it's it's my recent bugbear and I've done so many videos about it. But like one kind of classic comment I get is people saying like, oh, you must be fun at parties. Like let people have their fun. Like why are you telling people what they shouldn't, shouldn't buy? And actually, you know, you do get that kind of thing quite a lot. But what you can do is you can reply to it and say, hold on, let, let's talk about why I think it's important to to say, you know, and, and in that case, it's saying, you know, people can have a Stanley Cup. They just don't need 20. And here's, you know, here's a couple of stats about it. And But you can use it. And so I think often... How much money do people have? They're pricey, by the way. I know, I know. But we'll get them at a discount when they all end up in the charity shop next year because no, that, right. that's what happens. But, you know, I think often with criticism, it's actually a point. And it was interesting because I did do that for one of these Stanley Cup videos. And I did, you know, kind of make a response. And actually the person who left the comment then left a new one and was like, you know, I really appreciate this point of view. Like, thanks for explaining it. A win. And it's a win. And so sometimes it's actually about taking the criticisms and the negative comments and using it as as a way to say, like, here's a really good point, you know. And, And I think often on social media, you miss the nuance because you have to cram all of what you're wanting to say into 90 seconds or into a certain number of words. So you do, you, you can miss things out just because you don't have the time or mm. you don't have the, the space. So actually being able to reply and, and use it. So, but also, I mean, I think just as a general point, social media is not real, right? You can just put your phone away, right? Like 
you can remove yourself from it. How often do you have to tell yourself that? Because it's a daily thing for me. Well, this is the thing. I also, like, you just kind of get put in your place when, like, you know, I'll be sitting talking to my boyfriend and I'll be like, oh, there's just this thing that happened today. And he's like, I have no idea what you're on about. And you're like, oh, yeah, it's all in my world. Yeah. You know, like, people, no one else is looking at the comments and, yeah. and stressing over these. And so you can remove the comments you can delete and you can just take time away and it's not to say that online hate is not a thing but it's about saying that you can set a boundary and just remove yourself from it and and not let it bother you and you know I have never gone to a talk a presentation or done it and had people say that to my face and it's because you know that people are just mm. saying it it's on social media so you know I think there's also just a point of and and that's not to kind of throw away I know that you know online bullying is a huge issue but I do think there is ways to manage it and I've managed to do that better you know probably back in 2018 2019 if I got a horrible comment I would sit and think about it and reread it and be you know really sweating over it of course but over the years you just learn how to deal with it whether it's removing the comment blocking the person just taking time away responding to it you know people learn their own ways of doing that and mm -hmm. I think that's what's helpful but that is something that you kind of learn over time but it stings right especially the first time it happens I'd imagine it would be quite yeah. I mean I've had it people say I can't go that girl's voice who's that daft lassie on the radio it happens all the time and you have she thinks she's really funny and you have these moments where oh, I'm sorry but that was funny. I'm funny <laughs> I know how dare you <laughs> and how, how do you deal with it what, what are some of the things that you do and do you know it is you just have to do exactly what you said and assume that there's no way that person would say that to my face and if they did say that to my face then you know that tells me a lot more about them yeah. but I think that it's come with age as yeah. well because yeah. for sure when you know when you're young and, and everything feels like the end of the world which yeah. I know is really patronizing but it's also so true yeah. um that is what I would do as well I would sit and dissect the comment and try and find the the fact and the truth in it yeah. when realistically you know it's just some guy's opinion somewhere that I'll never yeah. ever meet and you know learning to know it's okay to delete block remove that person yeah. you know was a really a big moment because otherwise I was just literally there could be a hundred lovely comments yeah, but and if one. there's one person that says I don't like your face I'm like, yeah. I'm a, what's wrong with my face it's like, like that's why I'm in radio yeah <laughs> <laughs> and that's a great reply though <laughs> that's why I do it. I know it can be tough but you know I think yeah there is a lot but I totally appreciate it and yeah. and sometimes it does get overwhelming you, I just take time away you know just take take time off yeah and yeah I mean it's an important lesson and, and it's one of those ones where it's like any advice feels relatively patronizing because people yeah. have to come to it in their own way and have to kind of figure it out yeah. which is which can be an agonizing process for sure but also as you say, you work out your own coping strategies and you work out whether it's more important to say it and have one person be negative about it than to keep your mouth shut and not be authentically you and not do what you want to do. It makes you makes you kind of sparkle. Yeah. Without saying that's a so yeah. Pinterest. I, I'm going to get that. I retract. On a, on a, yeah, get that. I don't on a little I'll put it on the wall. It'll be beautiful. <laughs> I know. But to be honest, and I think as well for me though, and maybe it's different if people only have a personal social media yeah but I do see mine as like part of my work yeah so you know I don't sit and just mindlessly kind of scroll and, and read and, and spend lots of time there so sometimes it's just about going on posting something that you want and then taking a step back yeah. and saying you know and trying to set boundaries you know if it's the weekend maybe I don't need to sit on Instagram today and you know kind of you know kind of doing that I know it can be more difficult and again it's it's a boundary thing and, mm -hmm. and it can be obsessive you know or if something's doing really well like you just sit and check it all day and, yeah. and, and it gets a bit too much so yeah yeah who's used my sound wow uh, <laughs> uh, the last few years have been wild and for you you have just done so much you've achieved so much in a relatively you know short time frame especially with everything that was going on in the world a few years ago um uh, when we just couldn't do anything yeah. but you still managed to to go out there and, and and make some really positive changes how do you deal with that climate anxiety and make sure that you you don't face the burnout trying to kind of battle this uh, on your own I suppose to a certain extent yeah I mean one of the key things is about kind of boundary setting as you said there was a term and it really came to light in COVID mm -hmm. doom scrolling right you were and 
it's because we had nothing else to do. So you would just be sitting scrolling and whether it's information about COVID at the time or information about any sort of injustice, there was loads of racial injustice, there was loads of climate crisis issues, there was loads of stories that were just a lot. And I think it's so important that we address those and, and we're aware of them and, you know, we don't hide away from it. But certainly it's about saying, OK, enough is enough for today. So for me, a couple of the things that I've tried to do is not necessarily, you know, I'm not too tech savvy. I've not set all those time limits on my apps and anything like that. But I do try and say, this is the time I'm going to look on social media for, you know, in the morning, not necessarily first thing, sometimes first thing. Mm. But, you know, I'm going to check the updates, see what's been going on, you know, see if there's anything I need to, to look at. And then normally it's at the end of the day. So, you know, the kind of last thing I do at work is, you know, check again, see what updates have been, you know, if I've had to post anything. Um, and I think that's been quite helpful so that I'm not just sitting aimlessly scrolling. Or if I am, I'm just trying to do it on a fun platform like TikTok or something where it's just for fun. Where I think I've also... Kind of in between all of that heavy stuff, there's just daft videos of exactly, dogs falling over. Yeah, exactly. Okay. So, you know, trying to not just sit on, for example, like Twitter, where it is just sometimes quite a lot. Mm. Um, so try to, you know, find the fun things. I also think with my news, I think news consumption is huge because, you know, Back in the day, it was the newspaper and the six o'clock news maybe on the telly or the radio. Whereas now, news is 24-7, you get it everywhere and it's mixed in with your social media, kind of whether you like it or not. So I've also tried to think about how I get my news. So I found a few really good daily news roundup podcasts, that sort of thing. So, you know, I, I've got a dog, so I walk my dog twice a day, three times a day. And I've got a few podcasts that I'll listen to. And it gives me all the updates for the news of the day. And it keeps me kind of in the loop with what's going on. And then if anything's really interesting, I'll go and go and kind of find out more about it. So I've tried to also kind of not just be sitting, because I think there was a bit in COVID where we all just sat glued to the telly because we wanted to know what the, the update was. So I think, you know, trying to find a way that you get your news and, you know, finding happy news stories or things like the happy news broadcast or like, you know, environmental stories that are really positive. So again, like trying to find those um, to make sure you do that. But I think that's a lot about just information and, and, and trying not to be overwhelmed by that. But I think when it comes to kind of climate activism and burnout, it can be really, really easy to just feel like there's always work to be done and basically just spend all your time doing it. So mm. I think partly what I've tried to do is make my climate activism, my campaigning outside of my job. So my full time job is I'm a PhD scientist. Right. So I'm Monday to Friday most of the time, nine to five. What day is it? Most of the time, yeah. <laughs> Not today though. Um, but you know, so that I try and like block that out and say, well, that's when I'm doing my PhD research. And if I have to take time out of it to do things like cool podcasts, yeah. I'll make that time up. But for the sort of campaigning work that I do, I try to keep it like a hobby. So if your hobby was dancing or swimming or running or whatever, you would normally do it maybe two, three nights a week. Yeah. And I so, so I try and keep it to that. You know, I try to keep it that amount of time. So it's not just all the time constant and I think that's really good but certainly for the burnout it's about finding other people so when I started the climate uh, not the climate stuff when I started the disposable vape stuff it was just me on my own and I was you know putting stuff out on social media saying I'm really annoyed about this issue is anyone else doing anything what's going on and very quickly realized there's a lot of interest there's a lot of stuff that we need to be getting on with so I thought okay Let's get people together. So there's been amazing organisations who have come together to do their bit. Like Young Scott did some amazing stuff about research and engaging young people. We've had local councils doing stuff. We've had loads of different organisations. Everybody's taken on their own bit. It might not be that they're necessarily associated directly with the campaign, but everyone's kind of taken chunks on and said, we'll tackle that. And I think that really helps with burnout is saying, I don't have to do it all by myself. There is other people who can help and divvying up that work. And it can be hard because you maybe have to give things away that you're like, oh, I would have quite liked to do that. But you're really good at the policy stuff. You're really good at the photography. You're really great at, you know, getting whatever it is. So I think partly for burnout, it's about bringing people together. And, you know, if there's an issue in your school, in your uni, in your local area with a business, you know, don't try and tackle it on your own. Do it with other people and Social media has been a great way for me to connect with people, but you can also join local groups. You know, there will be local wildlife group or activist group, whatever it might be, and you can just join it and, and find other people. And I think that's been the key thing for burnout is, you know, setting the boundaries, not spending every waking minute. Have people around you who go, right, that's, you know, that's enough, you yeah. know, like enough of the phone or like, come on, it's time for dinner or whatever it might be. Like having those people that, that can kind of keep you accountable is, is really important. But yeah, having other people that can help, I think has been key. And, 
you know, now the campaign is still rumbling on, but it's not taking up all my time. There's loads of people involved. I think that's the really key thing it is about, because also if I crash and burn, then it goes nowhere. So there's no, there's no point in me trying to do everything and then burning out. Um, so that's a few kind of tips and tricks I've had over the years for the climate anxiety stuff, but also the burnout. This is a biggie. If you had the power to get in a TARDIS right now, go back in time, mm. what advice would you give a slightly younger version of yourself? I assume you're going to start with period pants. Yeah. yeah, straight away from school. That that would be it. <laughs> that would be the single thing. <laughs> oh, I don't know. I mean, I think um, it would probably be something about... So the people that I had around me when I was... Uh, kind of looking at you know the end of school and thinking about what I wanted to do so I had my mum and my dad and my older brother and that was the kind of you know people right close to me and my mum and dad have both worked in their jobs at the same places for 30 years right and my brother is on the same track you know he you know had a very clear idea of what he wanted to do and already you know he's worked at this one place forever doing one job and so I think for me I would tell myself that it's okay if your career looks slightly different to those that are in your immediate family mm. or immediate friends. So, you know, I've already had more jobs than all of my family combined. I've got probably what I would, someone used the term portfolio career, which I love. Because wow. it makes it saying I do bits and bobs yeah. a bit more professional. <laughs> yeah. You know, so you've probably got a portfolio career. You've uh -huh. got, you know, different things that you could add on, you know, broadcaster, podcast host, social media, whatever it might be. Yeah. And I kind of love that. And I think I would have said to myself early on, just go for what you want to do, even if you don't know what the 30 year career might be. And it's okay to change because in each job that you do or opportunity that you get, you'll learn something different. And actually, you know, hindsight is twenty twenty because now looking back, I'm going, that's why I did that random three month internship. That's why I took on that really weird project because now I've got these skills or... I'm actually really glad that I didn't get that job or that mm. I totally failed in that thing because that's given me something else to think about and learn from. And so that would just be the advice about, you know, don't kind of look around and see what other people are doing and get work. Like, just go for it. And, you know, I could, in a couple of years' time, not have any more portfolio career opportunities and get a job and do it for 20 years. And that's also okay. You know, it's okay to, to be kind of changing like that. And I think that would just be the piece of advice because I was obsessed at the end of school of thinking what do I want to do for the next 30 years and that's not that's not reality you're talking about issues that seem completely insurmountable but that look yeah. at that like you don't even know who you're going to be next week when you're that mm. age as well because Absolutely. so many things change and it was really nice to hear what you said as well about like right at the start of the conversation just going well I like geography at school so that's what yeah. I did and it changed the whole trajectory of your life absolutely and I think if I'd been obsessing about a job yeah as in a profession a career I might have gone into something totally different mm -hmm. because I might have said, okay, I like geography, so I should be a geography teacher because that's a career that I can think of. Yeah. And then I might have gone into teaching and it might have been the totally wrong thing for me. You never know. Or it might have been that I thought, okay, I really like geography, so then I should probably go and be a landscape architect or a gardener. And then I would have maybe tried to think about a job. But instead I thought, I just know that I like this subject yeah. and there will be opportunities at the end of it. And I'm open to to letting that course kind of run and, and seeing where it goes. Laura, you are such a star. I feel like we could chat for mm. like another hour or three. There's lots. <laughs> yeah, there's so much, but you're doing incredible work. And I wondered if there's anything that you wanted to kind of say as a parting uh, message to mm -hmm. the Young Scots listening before we go. Oh, I don't know. I mean, I think just, you know, for me, I just picked something that I loved and, and just went with it. And I think you'll carve out a career in what you do. And also, I do speak to a lot of people though. So if anyone is listening and, you know, environmental stuff is a passion, sometimes it comes to you once you've already picked your subjects at school or yeah. once you've already picked what you're doing at college or uni or you've already got a job, you can also still make a really big contribution to environmental issues, even if you've not got an environmental job. We need filmmakers and graphic designers and creative people to help us with all the messaging. We need teachers and doctors and nurses and business people who can do sustainability in their fields. Mm -hmm. And so I just, I always get young people coming to me and saying, I need some advice. I want to, you know, have an environmental job. What do you do and how can I do it? And sometimes they'll already be on a path with something else. And actually they can be that environmental person 
in that industry. You know, I was speaking to someone who was talking about they were doing economics at uni and they felt like they'd made a total disaster because they were like, I actually love the environment and I'm doing economics and it feels like I need to maybe drop out. And I said, no, we need environmental eco economists. Yeah. We need people looking at finance and pensions and how do we make those more sustainable? I can't do that. That is not my skill set, but that could be yours. And so, you know, whatever you might be doing, whether it's, you know, yeah, whatever field it is, you can make that environmental if that's something that you're passionate about. And I think that's just my key takeaway as well as, you know, follow your dreams, follow your passions, all that kind of stuff. The Pinterest stuff. And the then, Pinterest stuff. Yeah. Also just don't feel that you have to give up what you're doing now to add in environmental stuff. Like it can be part of what you do. There we go. And we all go home and we look in our covers and we tip everything out <laughs> and we see how wasteful we really are. Yeah. It's such good advice though. There is something everyone can be doing. It is. And when the problems are so big, so I was on the train down to this, uh -huh. okay? And I got a coffee at the train station and I've got my little cup with me. Mm -hmm. And, you know, everyone else around me was using disposable cups, right? Mm -hmm. And I just thought, but I'm still saving one cup, right? It's still one cup that doesn't have to be manufactured, produced, shipped, and used just once. Like, I still saved that. And although in the face of everything, it's not going to make a huge difference. It's still something. And if more people do it, the more we influence, the more we can do it. So yeah, you know, be encouraged. All the changes that you make help shift society in a more sustainable way. And together, the more people doing all these wee things, the better. Laura, you're wonderful. Thank you. I have honestly loved this chat so much. <laughs> Uh, so thank you to everyone who is who's tuned in uh, for listening. Remember, if you need help or support with how you are feeling, Young Scott has tons and tons of information at young.scott forward slash I feel. That's uh, young.scott forward slash I, A-Y-E, we're Scottish, uh, feel. If you want to follow Laura's work, then make sure you're following her on Instagram and TikTok using Less Waste Laura. It does have a lovely ring to it's it, Laura. It's good, isn't it? You are right. Uh, or visit her website, lesswastelaura.com. Also, don't forget, if you're under 26, then make sure you get your free Young Scott National Entitlement Card. And with thousands of discounts in Scotland and across Europe, subsidised public transport and a whole lot more, uh, visit young.scott forward slash card for more info. Finally, Young Scott members can claim 100 reward points for listening to this episode by visiting Young Scott membership and typing in climate for your points code. If you're not a member yet, visit young.scott forward slash membership to get started uh, today and earn points for activities and access exciting rewards as well.